a man begins to ask himself certain questions. Uh, how can one even begin to put into words something so, um... Enigmatic? Uh, well, vast? No, not vast. Um, <laughs> but whatever it is. The, the quotes will explain the steady state theory. John Gribben, again in Nature. The biggest problem with the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe is philosophical, perhaps even theological. What was there before the Big Bang? This problem alone was sufficient to give great impetus to the steady state theory. But with that theory now sadly in conflict with the observation, the best way around this initial, initial difficulty is provided by a model in which the universe expands from a singularity, collapses back again, and repeats the cycle infinitely, indefinitely. Martin, Martin Rees in Before the Beginning uh, makes a reference to the steady state theory. For him, and here he's referring to his mentor, Dennis Chiyama, as for its inventors, it had a deep philosophical appeal. The universe existed from everlasting to everlasting in a uniquely self-consistent state. When conflicting evidence emerged, Shyama therefore sought a loophole, even an unlikely seeming one. Rather, as a defense lawyer clutches at any argument to rebut the persecution case. And Dennis Shyama himself stated the following, as quoted in Simon Tsai's book, the Big Bang, the origin of the universe. For me, the loss of the steady state theory has been a cause of great sadness. The steady state theory has a sweep and beauty that for some unaccountable reason, the architect of the universe appears to have overlooked. And a classic. <laughs> Arno Penzias in Genius Talk, Conversations with Nobel, uh, Nobel Scientists and Other Luminaries states, well, some people are uncomfortable with the purposefully created world. To come up with things that contradict purpose, they tend to speculate about things they haven't seen. And Robert Jastrow in God and the Astronomers states, Sometimes some scientists aren't happy with the idea that the world began this way. Until recently, and that was written in 1978, Many of my colleagues preferred the steady state theory, which holds that the universe had no beginning and is eternal. And Stanley Jackie, in Science and Creation, uh, stated the following about Sir Fred Hoyle, who proposed the steady state theory. And it is that um, such theories were based on, quote unquote, openly anti theological or rather anti Christian motivations. And Stephen Brush in Scientific America notes, many scientists, particularly in Britain, liked the simplicity of the steady state theory and so continued to cling to the concept. They pointed out that one did not have to make arbitrary assumptions about a Big Bang or worry about what happened before the Big Bang. And going on with this, Robert Dickey in Astrophysical Journal, this states that the st steady state theory, quote, relieves us of the necessity of understanding the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. And Christopher Isham in Physics, Philosophy, and Theology, A Common Quest for Understanding, states, perhaps the best argument in favor of the thesis that the Big Bang supports theism is the obvious unease with which it is greeted by some atheist physicists. At times, this has led to scientific ideas, such as a continuous creation, which is the steady state, or an oscillating universe, being advanced with a tenacity which so exceeds their intrinsic worth that one can only suspect the operation of psychological forces lying very much deeper than the usual academic desire of a theorist to support his, her theory. Now, The steady state theory proper might be, have been disproved, but I must say, in another way, in a certain manner of speaking, it is more popular than ever. Now, it might not be the actual technical steady state theory proper, but the idea that matter is eternal and therefore the universe is eternal is, I think, more popular than ever. And I'll give you an example of it right now. 
This is from a debate between Brian Sapien and Kelly O'Connor of the Rational Response Squad versus Kirk Cameron and Ray Comfort of the Way of the Master. Uh, no, Ray says that God exists outside of time. Um, you know, so he's created this, basically, the argument that he gave you, he doesn't even believe. Um, you know, everything needs a creator, except for this one magical thing at the beginning of it that doesn't need a creator. Um, science has a, uh, a law, it's called uh, the third law of thermodynamics, um, which shows us, and it's one of the most tested laws in science, that matter or energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That we always have the same amount of matter and energy. We could blow up this building and while it would look completely different, there would be the exact same amount of matter and energy in the universe. That tells us, scientifically, if we were to use a more scientific approach, that the components of our world today, our universe, have always existed. And we have real science to lend credence to that. Knowing that, and knowing that the other side of the coin is to create something to explain it away. This is called, in logic terms, an argument from ignorance. Ray doesn't know what created the world, so he's made up a god to tell you that that is what's created the world. Um, you know, knowing that, that we have these two options. One thing that we don't have any proof for, that we just make up, and another one that we have this scientific theory, this law, actually, that's been tested over and over and over and has never been shown wrong. All signs point to the fact that the universe has just always existed and no God is needed to explain it. And if you're a philosophy buff, you would have heard of this term, Occam's razor. And Occam's razor tells us that the most simplest solution is the most plausible. And in this case, the simplest solution is no God. First, a, a little point of clarification. He referred to the third law of thermodynamics. He's really referring to the first. But uh, just taking the statement as it is, so you, you see his point is matter is eternal. The universe is eternal, and I mean, that's what I mean. This is out there. This is, like I said, perhaps more popular than ever, than ever with the advent of the uh, Internet. Uh, I personally think that the explanation is extremely simple, which is that when you're talking about the laws of thermodynamics, you're talking about within the box, right? I mean, you're talking about within the universe. You're talking about a law that functions in here, okay? I mean, and that's the issue when you're talking about science and the laws we know. That's what you're talking about. It doesn't necessitate that the matter or the universe is eternal, but that once you have the universe, now inside that box, yes, that law applies as far as we know. And in fact, I believe that this is predicted in the Bible itself, this first law of third of thermodynamics right in Genesis 2 1 through 3 thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made and so there you have it God was working on his creation, and at a certain point in time, it's done, it's finished. And there's the law, first law of thermodynamics. No more energy, no more uh, matter. It's, it was there, and there it is, finished, done. A finite amount. Now, let me go back to Robert Dra Jastrow, who states that, Theologians generally are delighted with the proof that the universe had a beginning, but astronomers are cur curiously upset. Their reaction provides an interesting demonstration of the response of the scientific mind, supposedly a very objective mind, when evidence uncovered by science itself leads to a conflict with the articles of faith in our profession. It turns out that the scientist behaves the way the rest of us do when our beliefs are in conflict with the evidence. We become irritated, we pretend the conflict does not exist, or we paper it over with meaningless phrases. Some prominent scientists began to feel that the same irritation over the expanding universe that Einstein had expressed earlier. Arthur Eddington wrote in 1931, I have no axe to grind in this discussion, but the notion of a beginning is repugnant to me. I simply do not believe that the present order of things started off with a bang. The expanding universe is preposterous, incredible. It leaves me cold. The German chemist Walter Nernst wrote, 
To deny the infinite duration of time would be to betray the very foundation of science. More recently, F Philip Morris of MIT stated in a BBC film on cosmology, I find it hard to accept the Big Bang Theory. I would like to reject it. And Alan Sandage of Palomar Observatory, who established the uniformity of the expansion of the universe out to nearly 10 billion light years, said, It is such a strange conclusion. It could not really be true. Einstein wrote, the scientist is possessed by a sense of universal causation. This religious faith of the scientist is violated by the discovery that the world had a beginning under conditions in which the known laws of physics are not valid. And as a product of forces or circumstances, we cannot discover. When that happens, the scientist has la lost all control. If he really examined the implications, he would be traumatized.